As Singapore sets its sights towards a resilient future, change starts today, no matter how small. In Tampanese, home cooks make lunch with unusual ingredients. Three, two, one, start cooking! Katong's residents try locally grown produce served up by chefs in the neighbourhood. And residents in Queenstown become home farmers. I'm Ravi G and this is the CNA Green Plan Challenge. Climate change threatens food security. Singapore imports 90% of our food supply, so any disruptions can be devastating. And with just 1% of land allocated to food production, what can we do to make us more self-sufficient? We want to triple our local production from the, the current level today. But we have to do it with the same amount of land. So with 1% of land, we're going to produce 30% of our nutritional needs. And for individuals, I think our lifestyle matters as well. When each one of us takes steps to change, I think the cumulative aggregate effect will be tremendous. Are Singaporeans ready to adapt to the climate challenges coming their way? To find out, we are at Tampanese, a thriving hub in the east of Singapore. With many big shopping malls, dozens of coffee shops and numerous cafes, the town offers a wide range of good food. Have you ever paid attention to the ingredients that go into your favourite dishes? I mean, they're always available, so what is the big deal, right? What if I told you that your favourite dishes' ingredients aren't available? Will you be willing to adapt to new ones? To see how adaptable Tampanesians are when it comes to their food choices, they are going on a shopping trip. So each participant will be given a shopping basket and an instructions card. Each card has a category of items listed on it. Participants will have to buy items based on the category listed on their cards to prepare a simple meal of meat, seafood or vegetables. But their trip to the supermarket will be disrupted by various climate scenarios. Will they settle for alternative ingredients? And can they still spend within a $20 budget? A special green coach joins our residents. She will be giving them some shopping tips along the way. Our food supply are affected because every time, as you have seen, when it's a flood, crops get washed away. But we in Singapore, we diversify our sources so that when one source is affected, we can actually substitute from other places. But consumers like you will have to then be quite smart if you see that prices of food from a certain country has gone up, look for alternatives. Heavy rainfall has hit the region and floods have destroyed huge areas of farmland. Crops are wiped out, resulting in a shortage of certain vegetables. Okay, so we've got beetroot that's $3, because it's canned, which means it will not be affected by fresh vegetables flood. It's already $20. Okay. <laughs> If you want to change the meat, you can get mushrooms. No, other ones. Oh, shall we go? <laughs> <laughs> Your vegetables are affected, right? Yes. So how do you intend to tackle it? Oh, you're going for frozen? Go for the frozen right Nice, okay. If you don't want to go hungry, you have to be a little bit more creative mm -hmm. about what you can eat. They all have interesting recipe, yeah? Yes. Interesting <laughs> to know what they are preparing for themselves. Okay, just a simple meal, which is steamed rice, then steamed sea bars and then some simple white cabbage and end with a fruit. That's wonderful. Actually, yeah. the cabbage is very good because it's not so perishable. You can keep. Yeah. It's, it's very robust vegetables. Next, rising temperatures are hurting seafood and meat supplies. So shoppers are learning how to be more mindful with their choices. Because seafood is affected, you are now pushed to pick frozen seafood. Yeah. For me, it's fine, right? Like, as in, they last longer. Frozen well, seafood is the same nutritional content in terms of fresh. So why not just take the frozen? I mean, it's cheaper. How much does it cost? Three dollars. Okay. I calculate. I learned that um, actually we have to be very flexible. So for me, I tend to go for the usual products that I go for. But I really have to be mindful that I have to expand my repertoire, try different things, even in good times. I chose a plant-based chicken burger, pasta, 
uh, canned chickpea and uh, xiao bai cai. Eating plant-based burger, it, it, it fulfills our protein requirement, also fulfills our craving for meat as well. Once again, I thank you all for taking part in this challenge. Remember, food sustainability is achievable. So I think a round of applause to all of you who took part. After testing the residents' ability to adapt when crisis strikes, it's time for the next challenge. Tampanese home cooks are gathering for a cookout, but before that, a trip to the supermarket. I'm here to purchase some items for our participants. In specific, I'm looking for some locally produced items. Did you know that it's really easy to spot locally produced items? Let me show you. If you were to look at locally produced items packaging, there's a bright red logo on it, and it indicates Singapore. It's that simple. These new labels seek to encourage greater support for local produce. There's also a star rating system to help consumers make better choices. A single star indicates the produce is freshly grown in Singapore. Two stars indicate produce that is grown under the Good Agricultural Practice System, also known as GAP Certified. While a three star rating is given to produce both GAP Certified and grown sustainably. The ingredients are all set, our celebrity chef judges are ready, and our home cooks are raring to go. Hi everybody, welcome to the CNA Green Plan Sustainability Cookout Challenge. The rules are simple. Each pair of home cooks has one hour to prepare two dishes assigned to them. But there is a catch. Key ingredients are missing in each dish. Oh, there's no fish. <laughs> Where's the fish? It's still in the water. <laughs> in the sea. We really are using the jackfruit chunk instead of chicken. So participants, you have exactly an hour to prepare two courses. If you guys are all set, in three, two, one, let's get cooking! Fried rice without real eggs, sweet and sour fish without fish, and an entire dish made using just canned food. These home cooks have their work cut out for them. Yeah, I was a little bit anxious because I've never used liquid egg in um, fried rice. So I had to play around and try to you know, manage in that sense. I had to cook the sweet and sour fish, but we substituted the fish with cauliflower instead. Because I wasn't expecting to cook with cauliflower, I thought like we were going to just cook with frozen fish or something. Do you want to add a bit of chilli? I'm, I'm a good fan of chilli, so yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> For our masaman curry, instead of chicken, we were provided bottled jackfruit, not even fresh. Yeah. Have you guys, have you had masaman before? Have you yeah, yeah. cooked it before, yeah? yeah? Yeah. It's one of my favorite curries. I, really? I, love, the, yeah, I love the depth of That's the flavors of it. No, 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 no. <laughs> and have you ever cooked with jackfruit? Yeah, you yeah. have. But fresh jackfruit, not the one in the... Okay. okay. Yeah. I actually believe that frozen goods and canned or even bottled uh, items can be as tasty. It, it just depends on how you cook it. Hi, Abilash and Grené. How's it going for you guys? Oh, I think it's, uh, well, it's my first time cooking with canned sardines. Okay. And I think so far, so good. <laughs> Chefs, we're halfway through. You guys had a chance to go around. What are your thoughts? Some of them really look like they know what they're doing. Some of them are running around and feeling a bit nervous, but that's fine. It's looking good out there. They're, they're putting up good competition. I think there's going to be a lot of good dishes to try. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop cooking! Good job, everybody. Limited by ingredient constraints, how did the home cooks fare? Can they impress our judges? We have this uh, very traditional Chinese Hong Pao chicken here and egg fried rice. Wow, this Hong Pao, bro. Guys, good job. Solid. Is it? It's a bit sweet and sour fish. We're using the cauliflower. This is our masaman curry. Actually, masaman curry used to use chicken, but you guys give us a jackfruit to work with. Mmm. Smells good. Yeah, that's delicious. The, the texture, the flavour, it normally takes a very long time to get that sort of consistency and flavour background. Yeah, it's good time. It's really good. Very good, good, good swing, Sarah, yeah. It's very crunchy and nice. Wow. 
Well cooked. Well done. Well done. Good. We have a vegetable soup here. Yeah, we use uh, a lot of spices. For this soup to enhance the overall flavor of the soup. Very smart. Yeah, this is a fish curry. It's made up of tomato puree and the canned fish. Good texture. Mm. Go ahead, bro. That's good. It's good, bro. Try not to spill. You can taste the broth from the from the bean from the bean paste. Awesome. Good job, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking part in this challenge. Despite the switches and changes, you guys did extremely well. Round of applause to all of you. Yeah. As you know, this is a contest. But before we get to the winner, let's hear it from the chefs first. I think everything I've tasted today has been amazing quality and I would be happy to pay for it at any restaurant tonight. Yeah, man, I think everyone's a really good sport changing the ingredients and coming up with a plan on, on, on the spot. Despite swapping out some crucial ingredients, every dish still delivers on flavour and quality. The home cooks have done their part. It's now the judge's job to decide who's the winner. So, you guys are ready? Yes. yes. And the winner is... Group 2. Congratulations, Group 2. You guys did so well. Okay, my experience was something very different today. I think I've learned a lot of things today that I would like to apply back at home. For example, having to use um, liquid egg instead of fresh egg. That's something that I would definitely want to use and something I've learned today. From this experience, I learned how I can cook myself when the things are not available. Like the live fish is not there, here the canned fish is there. So that I learned like we can make it from our own whatever things are available and make the dish. Throughout the activities, residents in Tampanese learn how to adapt their menus in the event of natural disasters caused by climate change. And the region could see much more of those in the years to come. With global warming, sea levels are expected to rise about a metre or more by the end of the 21st century. And tropical nations like Singapore are the most vulnerable. So the government is investing heavily on coastal defence and inland flood protection. We are setting aside both the resources to tackle flood and to protect Singapore, as well as building up the expertise and the experience of dealing with rising sea levels. We need to find a model that can tell us where are the vulnerable areas and what would be the solutions to them. It's a many, many tools out there. Each one got to be implemented in the most cost-effective way. And the, the best way to do that is to have a long-term plan and long-term execution strategy. Part of this strategy is exploring nature-based solutions like mangroves. But for these coastal plants to act as natural defenders against climate change, we need to keep our marine environment healthy. With this in mind, residents from East Coast are here on a weekend for a beach cleanup. They are guided and nudged on their green journey by a group of passionate coaches. And, and what happens to this microplastic in the water? The, the fish is marine. Can we reduce the use of plastic? Can we not throw away things uh, and consider uh, reusing it for other purposes? So that's called upcycling. Our vision for a greener East Coast is really part of Singapore's vision of a, a greener Singapore. We are building on what we have thankfully inherited from our founding fathers on keeping Singapore clean and green. It's important for us to have citizens who feel uh, passionate about this, who are taking action. Now in that regard, you know, this is very much a part of our Singapore Together movement. I believe everyone can make a difference and together we can make an even bigger difference. Changing our eating habits at home is an important step to building up Singapore's food resilience. But how can restaurants do their part? In the laid-back east of Singapore is the neighbourhood of Katong a food haven and home to many a foodie. The perfect place to conduct a CNA Green Plan Challenge revolving around food. Nithya Lila runs a pop-up restaurant called Brunch Bandits. She's a strong advocate for local produce. In the days to come, Nithya will be introducing local ingredients to restaurants and diners. 
right here in Katong. Hi, Nidia. Hey. Hey, how have you Hi. been? Good. Nice to see you. Yes, it's been a very sweaty day today. But despite wearing the mask, I can really smell this delicious meal. Oh, I'm glad. To showcase the beauty of our homegrown produce, Nithia is making tacos using jackfruit grown in Singapore and nasi ulam, a rice and herb salad featuring native greens. I think a lot of our traditional plants can have very strong flavours mm -hmm. and also quite hard, difficult to enjoy textures that we're not familiar with anymore. Yeah. They can be very bitter. Mm -hmm. So when it's locally grown, you can get the young shoots, you can get the young leaves uh -huh. and even the mature leaves, they tend to be much softer and nice. not as bitter. Okay. Yeah, so there's a real difference between commercially farmed for import versus locally grown in good soil. I see. For sure. It's easy to see why Nithia is so passionate about local produce. Our host discovers that the jackfruit lends a certain meatiness to the tacos. And the nasi ulam, packed with local herbs and veggies, is a flavour bomb. Local restaurants and outlets, they could be incorporating this kind of food for them, right? 100%. Right? If you're a consumer, you go to restaurants, you ask for these things, mm -hmm. the restaurants are going to want to do it. Or as a restaurant, you take the charge, and then your consumers will adapt, right? So yeah. it has to happen somewhere. Right? There's so much wealth in our local knowledge. Definitely. That I think uh, we can share with the world. How much do Singaporeans know about our local produce? Let's put some Katong residents to the test with a little social experiment. They think they're here for a canapé party. Imperial Osteria caviar and creamy egg, lobster tartlet covered in a coconut blanket with olive oil, basil and micro herbs, lemongrass mousse with citrus lemon jelly and coconut flakes, and a sprinkle of thyme, each featuring a star ingredient. But of course, there's no free lunch. After tasting, these diners will have to guess which country the star ingredient is from. The zesty twist is, Every single one of them is locally sourced right here in Singapore. First up, salmon roulette with pink peppercorn, fennel, lime jelly, fennel seed cream. What do you think about the taste? I really like the pink peppercorn taste and the texture of the sea grapes. I think it's really good. It's definitely mind-blowing. And my guess would be that it's from France. Please raise the flag of the country you think the key ingredient is from. In this case, it's sea grapes. First dish that was made of uh, sea grapes. I didn't know that we had that, or we sea were growing grapes. that. Yeah, sea grapes, yeah. I thought it was it was from overseas. I thought it was from Japan. Surprisingly, it tasted very good. Next, we have the Imperial Austria caviar and creamy egg. The key ingredient is eggs. Which country do you think it's from? Okay, Japan, really? Okay, France, Auntie really? Wow. You think our eggs are all the way from France? Interesting, interesting. I actually put up Thailand the most because I've always had the impression that Singapore depends heavily on its neighbouring countries, especially that of Thailand, in order to provide for its food itself. The answer is Singapore. For the third dish, it was a fish. And the answer is... Singapore! Initially, they were quick to raise the flag sort of they already knew. But as it progressed, they started discussing with each other because they did sort of maybe not know where the item came from. Or some of them sort of understood that, hey, wait, this can be done in Singapore. Maybe it is from Singapore. The key ingredient, the answer is not Malaysia, Singapore. Some of you look excited. Some of you are like, I know it. I know where this is going. My key takeaway is that Singapore can grow and harvest so many produce and ingredients and can be grown here. Sustainability-wise, it's good to grow things locally because then it'll be a lot fresher mm -hmm. and reduced carbon footprint and your emissions by growing locally and Singaporeans buying from farmers. The social experiment is proof that there's much to be proud of when it comes to our homegrown produce. But are chefs ready to embrace the push to eat local? I've got in touch with three cafes in Katong. Penny University, The Garden Slug and Group Therapy. I would like to find out if these cafes are willing to put locally sourced items on the menu. They have to create a menu and use local produce as the star ingredient. 
we will find out what their customers think of these items. I would like to see if these chefs can elevate local produce to the point where there would be a demand for it. To help them out, Nithya is giving the chefs a crash course. We're going to start with a Moringa quiche. So this time, instead of using kale or spinach, we're going to use Moringa. So do you guys know what Moringa is? No. Yeah. No <laughs> Have you? Uh, I know it in Tagalog, but I don't know it. It's called Mulange, right? Malungay. Malungay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Next up, a ceviche using fish caught in Singapore waters and some local greens. So we've got some fresh green chilies I plucked this morning, some laksa leaves and some papio lime. So we blend that all together, give it a bit of a stir. Infusing these dishes with a local touch, Nithya has shown the chefs how versatile our homegrown produce can be. What do you think is the challenge restaurants and chefs will face when trying to incorporate local produce into their existing menus? First of all, it's consistent supply and quantity. That's the beginning, right? But the next step is maybe not being very familiar with the ingredient mm. as well, right? You know, we have this goal 30 by 30, mm -hmm. so we're going to grow 30% of our own crops by 2030. So there can't be a disconnect from wanting to grow stuff mm -hmm. and it not being in our restaurants. Mm -hmm. It's not that local produce doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more of it and we're going to see a bigger quantity of it. The secret to good food lies in the quality of the ingredients. This makes a farm tour the perfect head start for our chefs before their final cookout challenge. Welcome to Kofa Technology Farm. We're actually a family-run business. Our farm business actually started about 40 years ago, so we are actually one of Singapore's pioneer and one of Singapore's largest vegetable supplier for local produce. From soil farming to hydroponics, Kofa Technology Farm has had to adapt to the constraints of farming in Singapore. You have to know what kind of nutrients will grow our vegetables best in Singapore climate, what kind of vegetables can be grown hydroponically. They have embarked on a new venture, Green Harvest, along with plans to build Southeast Asia's largest hydroponics glass greenhouse. Here at their R&D greenhouse is where leafy greens are grown. By regulating airflow and supplementing nutrients, high-tech systems provide a controlled environment for these vegetables to thrive all year round in our tropical climate. Crunchy. Yeah, crunchy. Fresh, very fresh. <laughs> very juicy. Ah, yeah. When the first bite, right, the, yeah. the burst of juice. Ooh. Our vegetables, right, the, one, the ones that go into the supermarket or the VM market, right, actually go through a lot of taste tests. The first few tries, they're actually quite bad. They are mm. bitter, you know, yeah. something went wrong with the mixture of nutrients. Yeah, so over the years, these are the ones that we have now. Most great chefs begin the culinary journey with this one ingredient, the humble egg. Today, it's back to basics for our chefs and looks like they've picked the right time to visit. Today, we'll need your help to help us inspect the system and pick up any mislaid eggs. When you say inspect, we need to get into the cage. Yeah, we will all have to get in. Uh, okay, guys, all the best. <laughs> Chew's Egg is the only cage-free egg facility in Singapore. Here, chickens roam freely in a controlled indoor environment, safe from dangers and diseases. One thing that we do need to do manually is that we do get 3% of mislaid eggs. So these are eggs that sometimes end up uh, in the middle of the system or on the floor, and that's where I need your help for today. They are packing it on my boot. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah, not gonna pack. You can, you can just grab it. Oh my God, no, I don't, I uh, cannot. Do you wanna grab it instead? Protect it. I know, oh my God, I see it. <laughs> okay, go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Excuse me. Yeah. So actually, these are the nest boxes. They'll go in to lay eggs. A lot of work after today. <laughs> Bro, but spay me, you know. <laughs> Two. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm afraid of birds. I have this phobia. So when I saw the cage, I was like, I'm not going in. I chickened out, quite literally. How about you guys? Like, how was your experience, you know? When I first uh, stepped in, I felt like I'm uh, the papa hen, Every, like all the chickens are coming in <laughs> towards me. It was, it was a unique experience. So were they like coming to safeguard their egg or something? Or were they like cool? Actually, they were quite friendly. Yeah, so they were just curious. 
Yeah, I feel as well. That's, yeah. Within just 24 hours, these eggs will be stocked in a supermarket near you. That's how fresh the local eggs we buy are. Our final stop, an indoor fish farm, a first in Singapore. We have 12 culture tanks here, and then at the upper deck, it is the filtration tanks. What we are doing here is that we put all the fish at the lower level, okay, we feed them, and we pump the water up to do the water treatment to clear away all the rubbish and it circulates back. The farm produces up to 18 tonnes of jade perch and red tilapia annually. With Singapore looking to produce 30% of our nutritional needs by 2030, technologies like this are a huge step forward. To increase our food production sustainably and ethically to eat local, these are all steps we must take to bolster Singapore's food security. And chefs can drive this change. Freshness is very important when you are making food for, for our customers. So having it locally will definitely have it fresher than imported from any other place. Now that they've seen the potential of local produce, it's up to them to show us what they've got. Our chefs have a week to create a three-course menu using homegrown ingredients. As chefs, we are always striving to look out for fresh ingredients. The freshness of the ingredient can determine the flavour profile of the dish itself. So I believe that local ingredients can help us to achieve a new level of flavour within our, our food. Oh, it's very exciting, not just for me, but for my team as well. It was quite hectic back in the kitchen. And we had to execute a full menu, new way of plating, new uh, ingredients. And the moment of truth has finally arrived. Today's the day of the big tasting. At the Garden Slug, Chef Dominic has used local mushrooms to create his starter course. He's following that with a gumbo using locally farmed sea bass and finishing off with a cucumber and basil dessert. Chef Moose is serving up a Tunisian soup dish composed of locally farmed seafood and a tomato with a side of truffle puree. Over at Group Therapy, Chef Jonah has made a snapper agua chili using locally farmed snapper, a sea bass with turnip for the main course, and a coconut and moringa gelato for dessert. Three cafes, three chefs with different ideas on incorporating local produce to three sets of diners mostly from Katong. I like the flowers in there. I was quite blown away to learn that this is all grown locally. It's really, really fresh. I really like the flavours coming through. Uh, they, the, everything just, just pops. You could tell that from their expressions and the way they were excited to share the pictures and thoughts with their friends and whatnot. All the mushrooms are grown locally? Yes, actually there's a local farm here. You can also find it in like Giant and NTUCs and then um, they have their own like label and you can see there that it's locally farmed. Actually their golden oyster mushroom is very good. You can taste the nuttiness and the freshness of the mushroom. Farming might not be the norm in Singapore, but this tiny farm-to-table experience has given the diners and chefs much food for thought. To me, uh, it's really more of a change of mindset. Being in Singapore, we are so used to having the notion that almost all of our ingredients are actually imported. So it's actually good to learn that so many of these ingredients can actually be sourced locally. It will be very interesting to see how we can further explore this. I think the biggest learning factor that I would like to take home is how they grow the vegetables or really the seafood and the freshness of it and really execute the concept of like farm to table. Actually, everyone loved the food and it was overwhelming. The whole experience was overwhelming and I don't know, I'm very high with excitement and happiness right now. <laughs> yeah, with all the positivity that is coming in and yeah. The experience has inspired the chefs to take what they've learned beyond the challenge. They will be introducing at least one of these dishes onto their regular menus and doing their part to showcase the beauty of homegrown produce. In highly urbanised Singapore, land is scarce for farming. The city grows food indeed. 
urban farms have taken root in recent years. And community gardens can also be found in neighbourhoods across the island. The target, as part of the Singapore Green Plan, is to achieve 30% of all its food supply by 2030. To reach that goal, all of us have a part to play. But what does it take to have a thriving home garden? This is Queenstown. A modern sort of town, but one with lots of heritage and lots of nature. It's also home to Edible Garden City, a pioneer of the urban farming movement in Singapore. Which one of you have killed a plant before? I myself have murdered many. I understand it's an experiment and growing plants today will master it. Since 2012, Edible Garden City has been spearheading the move for Singaporeans to grow their own food by building edible gardens in underutilized spaces and organizing farming workshops. Today, I've asked 50 residents living in and around Queenstown to come here for an experiment. They will learn the basics of farming in just an hour. And after that, I will find out how many of them are good enough and keen enough to do farming in their own homes. A very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. The CNA Green Plan Challenge. I think it's kind of uh, exciting to learn how to grow your own food. I have next to zero knowledge about it. I like to understand more on how to grow edible plants. So I tried a couple of times, it didn't work out. So this may help to me to learn it and uh, apply at my home. But now there is this big question. What do plants need? Water, yes. Sunlight, CO2, yes. And nutrients. Yes, they need all of that. But the most important in all of these is the human factor. It's us, it's our care, it's love. Plants need love. And according to our green coach, Bjorn, showing love for plants is also self-care. There's also a lot of mental wellness benefits from gardening and growing your own food. So nurturing a plant in some ways is like kind of nurturing yourself as well because you see how nature can be quite challenging sometimes but also very giving at times. And it gives you a, a sense of grounding, uh, understanding uh, the environment around you. From watering tips to fertilizing needs, repotting to propagating, the residents are given all the tools they need to start their own home garden. Now, to get the nice sweet potato bulbs, we need to wait a bit of time. It's like a baby actually, nine months, to get the sweet potato fruit. We always hear from our parents like how to plant something. And we don't really have the physical experience itself. But coming here this morning, filling the soil, planting our own sweet potato leaf. Uh -huh. It helped me gain some experience so that next time I can do the same as well. We used to grow tomatoes and then usually the tomatoes have a lot of aphids on them. Now based on this lesson, now we know how to get rid of the aphids. Beautiful! <laughs> Over the next few weeks, we will be challenging some of them to grow vegetables in their homes. Who will enjoy a bountiful harvest? And who will be the plant killer? We're here at Lucky Garden, a nursery in the Queenstown neighborhood. As you can see, there are plenty of beautiful plants here but today, we are only interested in the edible ones. Soon, our residents will be coming here to pick a few plants that they think they can grow at home. Let's see what tickles their fancy. Spicy. This is the very yeah, spicy, spicy type. Spicy. Oh, I love Wrong. spicy ones. <laughs> yeah, this is our type of... Oh, this is the Vietnam chili. Yeah. Okay. What is this one? Parsley. Parsley. Mm. Okay. And then I saw tomato over there. Uh, it's tomato very hard to take care. Yeah, but this one is easy to take care. How often do I have every, to water? Every day must water. Then okay. need the under in the right shape. So here's some gardening 101. 
Different plants require varying amounts of sunlight, water and humidity. So it's always wise to consider your home conditions before deciding which plant to buy. Our residents seem to be on the right track. We don't have a big area, so uh, right now we're actually planting our plants in the service yard. Hopefully there's enough sun for this lavender to grow and I could you know, cut it and I used it for my food. <laughs> How much sun does it need? This one, indirect sun. You can put next to the window. Indirect sun? Indirect oh, okay, sun. that's perfect. There's no sun in my house. So this is a spearmint plant. So I've been told that spearmint propagates quite profusely and it shouldn't require too much attention and too much sun. My flat has quite shaded. It doesn't have very much sunlight, which I think is going to be good for growing spearmint. So yeah, just water, a mm -hmm. bit of sun mm -hmm. and lots of TLC. Why did you pick these plants? I love the smell of oregano plant. Mm -hmm. and hopefully I can use this for cooking okay. and perhaps baking also, but uh, I'm not sure, maybe for cassia bread. Any challenges you foresee? I think we may have to deal with pests on them. Okay. Because uh, they look like very succulent plants. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we picked the laksa leaf and the cointreau because we yeah. see that these plants are used widely in Asian cooking and I guess we can use it in our future cooking as well. <laughs> it's been about a week since our residents went home with their new plants. It's time to see how their edibles are doing. Hi, Hi Ravi, welcome! Can you just explain to me what we have here? Sure. So this is the plant, you may remember it. Um, we got this a couple of weeks ago when we did the edible garden city. With nice, Sienic. okay. At that time, it only had these three purple leaves and then in the last two weeks, the green leaves have just sprouted. So far, it looks like it's going good for you. I hope so. Can you just explain, is there, are there any struggles or obstacles you faced? I think just over the last two months and like my experience, tending to a live plant, you really need to understand, you know, what's going on. Is the soil too wet, too dry? Uh, is the wind too strong? Is there not enough sun? Mm. So trying to understand in the morning what's going on with okay. the plant, that sort of gives you some time to yourself, time with the plant, time with nature in the little corner. Um, also, it starts the day with some calm. Yeah. You know, so I think it's been, it's, it's been really nice. At Lydia's house, farming is a team effort. Even six-year-old Hayden is tasked with a very important job. I think it's very important for children to learn how to do gardening because mm. that will also help them to appreciate more about planting and about eating more vegetables, healthy stuff. Okay. And I think it's a very healthy activity as well. It's, it's quite a good bonding for me and him as well to do the gardening together. Nice. Lydia is expanding her garden, but not every edible plant is taking well to her home environment. We started to grow xiao bai cai. But the thing is that there was no sunlight, mm -hmm. so what happens is that it grows very slowly. The lack of sunlight may be plaguing our new home growers, but Singapore is facing the opposite problem. The city is heating up. In the last 50 years, average air temperature has risen by 2 degrees Celsius. By the end of this century, an increase of another 4 degrees Celsius is imminent, and Singapore's hottest days could hit a life-threatening 40 degrees Celsius. We are working uh, to study how can we build a city that actually does not add to urban heat. Our buildings, our concrete, our hard paving actually reflects sunlight and it adds to the warming. How do we reduce that? How can we use trees, for example, to reduce urban heat? How can we use new products like cool paints that actually will help us absorb some of these heat? These are all R&D projects that we are doing to make sure that we have the solutions to a new, warmer world. In a research project called Cooling Singapore, sensors are deployed island-wide to collect temperature data in real time. This helps researchers identify urban heat shields where solar heat is more likely to build up. 
These insights can enable government agencies and citizens to take targeted action against hotspots in order to beat the heat. From newbies to budding home farmers, our residents have spent the last couple of weeks tending to their plants. And it's time to review their efforts. Come, Lily, my little garden. Yes, I'm dying to see your garden and what you have grown. Adeline is the designated green coach from Edible Garden City. Not only will she be assessing how well the residents are doing, she will also share some tips to help them farm better. Starting with the chans. So when I first bought them, I noticed the leaves are a bit droopy. Yes. And I do see some yes. little marks here, like tunneling marks. Those, I think, are the some kind of pest problem. Mm. Mm. Okay, it looks like you might be having leaf miners. Okay. Okay, mm. so those actually will chew on the inside of the plant. Wow. Like in between the leaves. One of the best ways to get rid of pests is to remove the affected leaves, okay. a process known as pruning. Well, yes, yeah. because here this is also one, damaged, right. so you want to cut it up to here. Sure. Okay, mm. so as close to the stem as possible, preferably like leaving a note there so that this can still grow. Right. Uh, the only thing is that whenever you're pruning, make sure that you don't prune more than one third of the plant mm. in order for the rest of the plant to still live and grow. Right. Okay, if you prune too much all yeah, at one up. time, I know, <laughs> and then the plant might not survive. Got it. Quite a few takeaways. Uh, one is the removing the pests uh, quickly. Have a couple of plants die. Uh because either there are pests or because there's too much fertilizer. So just start over again, uh, learn from my, my mistakes um, and also pick up tips from the coach, that's most important. So amending your soil means that like you put in more compost, more nutrients. Next up, a visit to Erfan and Nafisha's expanding garden. Looks like the couple has been keeping busy the last two weeks. The one plant that they got from our farm, which is the sweet potato plant, and they turn it into from one pot and they propagated it and change it into three different plants. So that is amazing to see that you can actually grow you know, plants very fast by just doing stem cutting. We just tried to cut and try to propagate. So in order to uh, do a proper stem cutting for the best results, sometimes it, it can grow like this but you should actually take away all these. Okay. Okay, so take away all the bottom leaves. Uh, you can leave like maybe two or three leaves at the top and that way it can grow the roots faster. As new growers, Erfan and Nafisha are not afraid to be experimental with their garden, even if it means making mistakes along the way. I can see that your laksa plant also has all these damaged parts. Okay, this hip sometimes is called burn tip. The sun might be too harsh for it, so you, you have to observe it if you put it away from the harsh sunlight. Does that improve? Okay. They have done a lot of innovative things, such as using food scraps, like the spring onions that they use in their kitchen. And instead of throwing it away, they managed to salvage it and then put the bottom part with the roots into soil. So over the Chinese year season, we had a few Mandarin oranges. Mm -hmm. After we had them, we took a few of the seeds and just planted them to see how it grows and oh. just wanted to mm. try. Yeah, I yeah. think our gardening is all about experimenting and not being afraid to fail. Yeah. You know, because if it fails, then you just try a different way again. Yeah. Yes. yes. So very good of you to do that. Hi, Lydia. Okay. So Over at Lydia's, nice Adeline is on a it's bit a of a rescue day. mission. Yeah, the lavender is not doing very well. It's actually, yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know whether it's because I have watered it too much mm, or... For sure, because lavender and rosemary, all these herbs, a lot of them definitely needs a lot of sun. Okay, at least four to six hours of direct sunlight. Yeah. So overall, Lydia, I really like the variety of plants that you have here. Okay, okay so I applaud you for that. 
some of the plants are not doing as well and usually there are only a couple of reasons that you need to investigate uh, okay? okay so the first and foremost is always like the soil mm -hmm. and then secondly will be like how much light it is getting and then third make sure that you're not over watering it uh. so you can do a moisture test by sticking your finger into the soil what I really like about her is her positive attitude. Her lavender plant didn't survive and died, but she still stays positive and she still keeps going on and try different things. So I think for all gardeners, they need to have this persevering attitude and keep trying and then they will find success one day. Lydia isn't the only one struggling with her plants. Over at Maxine's, she's having trouble providing the right amount of sunlight and water for her edibles. So this was the plant that we got from the nursery on Tangling Road. Right. And when I got it probably about three weeks ago, it was okay. quite a full lush pot. Yes. I have since harvested for yes. omelette and some cocktails. That's nice. And also because I think I overwatered it a little bit. Definitely, they are very leggy. It's What's also leggy? Show, leggy means that it's a, it's a condition called etiolation, where the stems are very thin and it seems like it's stretching to find light. Okay, so definitely it still needs a bit more light oh, than what okay. you are providing it right now in order for it to really flourish. Got it. I think important lesson is figure out what the environment of the apartment is before you decide what plants to grow. Mint smells lovely, but it needs a lot of sun and there isn't enough sun, which is why it's so sad at the moment. I'm gonna try and obviously recalibrate, right? I'm gonna promise to take my plants for a walk downstairs to the park. Um, but yeah, that was really useful information. How we eat matters to the environment. That's probably the key lesson our residents took home from the CNA Green Plan Challenge. Whether as shoppers, diners, cooks or farmers, they've all learnt that by taking small sustained steps, anyone can help build a more resilient future for Singapore. Join us again next week for another episode of the CNA Green Plan Challenge. In the meantime, we would like to congratulate the residents of Tampines. Your town is the winner of the CNA Green Plan Online Challenge Resilient Future Edition. Thank you for sharing stories of your green journeys with us.